kifogyatkozások nem jól a Yes. Well, let's get started. Uh, uh, just some brief administrative announcements. At the end of class, I'll hand out the first problem set that will also be available on Blackboard if you'd rather have an electronic one. Uh, so again, I recommend you look at it soon and uh, start working on it soon. Uh, one small piece of news, we might be able to get a TA to the class, so I'll keep you posted on that. Or at least a part-time TA who could uh, offer office hours. So uh, I'll keep you posted if we, that might be upcoming, so if you would prefer a different office hours or extra office hours relative to mine. So any questions about anything before we get started today? Okay, so I'll just uh, pick up where we left off last time. So we had been working on intractable problems, and I had been trying to go through some general advice I could give on what to do if we've come up with a model that leads to an intractable optimization problem. And I had mentioned that the first thing to do is make sure it's really a hard problem. Try and see if a force algorithm would work for your problem. If that doesn't work, you can try an approximation algorithm. If an approximation algorithm doesn't work, you can try a branch and bound algorithm. And can anyone tell me what would be a situation in which we might prefer, let's say, a brute force algorithm or an approximation algorithm or a branch and bound? What kinds of problems would a brute force algorithm be good for? Small yeah, if you have small problem instances, then brute force would tend to be a good choice. When might an approximation algorithm be a good choice? Well, it might be good if you have large or hard instances and you know it's okay not to have an optimal solution. Some kinds of problems we care quite a bit about how optimal or close to optimal the solution is, others it's not so important. What about branch and bound? When would that be a good choice? Well, what, is, what does branch and bound give us relative to these other methods? Yeah, so it will give you an optimal solution. So if you really care about that, it might be a better choice than an approximation algorithm. It will generally be faster than a brute force algorithm, though, at least if the instances aren't relatively small. So maybe a good choice if you've got moderately hard instances and you know you really want an optimal solution. So there are other methods we can consider. And I'll move on now to one that's not in the textbook explicitly, but I, I think I've added since then because I think it's pretty important to think of as a, an extra set of techniques, and that is to use a transformation. And what a transformation means is to take the hard problem you're trying to solve and turn it into a different hard problem and try to solve that one. So why might that be a useful thing to do? What, what could be the benefit of changing a hard problem into a different hard problem? Your problems are related, but one of them has a solution or a good enough solution to use. Uh, yeah, it might be that you can come up with a different way of representing the problem you're trying to solve, but maybe the algorithms aren't good enough for your original problem, or the algorithms don't exist because it's a new problem, but there might be really good algorithms for the problem you're trying to turn it into. So I want to give a couple of examples of that, where there are some classes of problems that are widely used for these transformations, because people put a lot of effort into figuring out how to solve those particular problems. So one common one that relates to another tractable problem we'll be seeing later is something called an integer linear program. 
So an integer linear program is a particular kind of optimization problem that has a specific form. It always has an objective function that looks like the following. So we want to minimize some constant a1 times a variable x1 plus a constant a2 times a variable x2, et cetera, up to some constant an times a variable xn, where the xn are the things we're trying to figure out. Those would be, for an integer linear program, integer variables, and very often we would say each of the xi's is simply 0 or 1, that would be a common way of representing it. And we have to get something that minimizes this function subject to a set of constraints. And these would be linear inequality constraints, which would look something like the following. There might be a constraint C11, where that's a constant times x1, plus C12 times x2, etc., up to C1n times xn is less than or in you know, less than or equal to some, let's call it B sub 1 and maybe C21 times X1 plus C22 times X2, etc., up through C2n times Xn is less than or equal to B2, and so forth. Just a set of linear inequalities like this. And these are going to put limits on the possible values to which you can set these X variables. And that basically is what an integer linear program is. And any NP-complete problem can be turned into an integer linear program. It's also an NP-hard problem. So there's always a way to do the transformation. And people have put a lot of effort into trying to figure out how to quickly solve these. So there are great solver programs for these. You can simply download off the web, or uh, you can buy one if you really want a, a, a professional quality one. People actually pay quite a lot of money to get a good professional quality ILP solver. But basically, if you can turn your problem into this form, then you can use these good solvers and often solve it more quickly than you could solve your original problem. So I'm simplifying quite a bit. Often a lot of design goes into figuring out the right way to represent your problem as an ILP. But you can often come up with a pretty simple solution relatively easily. So an example would be, suppose we're looking at a vertex cover problem. So to remind everyone, in a vertex cover problem, we would have some graph, and we're trying to find a set of vertices such that between those vertices, we have at least one endpoint of every edge in the graph. So if you wanted to represent a vertex cover as an ILP, what we could say is, for each vertex, v1, v2, et cetera, up through vn, we'll create a variable, x1, x2, up through xn, and we'll declare that if xi is 0, then vertex i is not in our vertex cover. If xi is 1, then vertex i is in our vertex cover. So then what we would try to do is try to minimize the size of our vertex cover by saying that we want to minimize x1 plus x2, etc., up through xn. And if we can do that, then we can get a minimum size vertex cover. The only catch is that we need to come up with a way of expressing that our assignment of variables is a vertex cover using inequalities. Can anyone see how you might do that? How might you express that there is at least one endpoint of the edge from V1 to V2 covered by a vertex? Well, we want to say either V Either v1 is there, which is equivalent to saying x1 is 1, or x2 is 1, or they're both 1. So can I, how do you express that as an in, uh, inequality? Um, for each vertex pair, you can declare a variable, say, i. So if it's v1 and v2, you can say i1, 2. And if v1 and v2 have an edge, then that variable can be 1. Eight. And it, if, it, if they don't, then it can be 0. Yeah, often it's helpful to come up with some auxiliary variables uh, to express uh, pieces of the problem you want to assert are true. In this case, it, you, you can actually bypass that. So you could say, for whatever edges we have, if we have an edge from V1 to V2, that's equivalent to asserting X1 plus X2 is at least 1. So if either of these is 1, that's satisfied. We could just say, in general, for any edge, let's say, vi, vj, in our edge set, we create a constraint 
do that, you end up with a, an integer linear program that's equivalent to your vertex cover. You could plug that straight into an ILP solver and it will solve your vertex cover and often be able to solve much harder instances than you could with a, a custom piece of code that you develop. Does that make sense to everyone? So another class of problems people often use is what are called satisfiability or SAT problems. So satisfiability problem also uses a set of variables, typically what we would think of as Boolean variables. So whatever we're trying to do, we would say that we have a set of variables xi, where xi is either true or false. And in a SAT problem, we express the problem in terms of a Boolean formula. So either x1 or x2 is true, and x3 and x4 and not x5 is true, and so forth. So just some Boolean equation. That's another NP-complete problem, a very well-studied one. And there are, again, a community of people who put a lot of effort in, into making fast SAT solvers. So if you can express your problem as satisfiability, and you can do that in a reasonably, com a reasonably compact way, you can often use a, sa a satisfiability transformation as a fast way of solving the problem. So any questions about that? Okay, that's far from an exhaustive list. You can use many well-studied problems for transformation, but those are a couple of simple examples that are widely used. The next thing you might consider is really a very broad class of algorithms that we refer to as <coughs> heuristics. And a heuristic isn't a specific kind of algorithm. It pretty much means any algorithm where we don't have good theory to tell us how the algorithm behaves. Usually it would be something that runs quickly, but is not guaranteed to give an optimal solution. And unlike an approximation algorithm, usually we can't prove anything specific about the quality of the solution. It's just something that we think will tend to sort of work well in practice most of the time. There are some specific classes of heuristics you commonly see. So a very common one is what's called a simulated annealing heuristic. And simulated annealing is actually closely related to a simulation technique we'll be covering later in this class and that we saw briefly in the first lecture. So if you remember our protein folding example where we considered how we could take chains of a protein and simulate the process of folding among different states, that's an example of a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. And we specifically presented it in terms of a, a particular kind of Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm called a metropolis algorithm, which is basically a way of trying to simulate the process of folding, which will tend to move you towards low energy states. But any kind of hard problem you can represent as a kind of Markov chain Monte Carlo system by coming up with some energy that is basically a way of encoding the objective function. So if, for example, we're trying to solve a traveling salesman problem, we might have, let's say, a graph and a, maybe a candidate traveling salesman path through that graph. We can try to come up with a Markov chain, so a set of moves that allow us to transform this traveling salesman path into other paths. So we could maybe say anywhere we see a piece of path that moves from vertex A to B to C to D, maybe we'll try the move of swapping the order in which we visit B and C. So we'll go from A to C to B and then to D and then otherwise take the same path. And that would define a set of moves we can use to rearrange our traveling salesman graphs. Now once we've got that, to run a metropolis algorithm or something similar, we would need some way of deciding whether this was a better move, so whether this improved our traveling salesman solution or made it worse. And basically, if you have an objective function for your problem, like the sum of the path weight, you can just kind of declare that an energy like we were doing protein folding. We can say if the cost of the path got lower, then we take the move. If it got higher, then we set some probability of taking it. So if it gets higher, we allow some small probability of making a worse move so you don't get stuck, kind of trapped in a local optimum. But basically, you let it move among possible solutions. 
and to turn that into simulated annealing, you just kind of gradually crank up the probability of taking more favorable moves and down the probability of taking less favorable ones until you kind of converge on a best solution. So that is known as simulated annealing. And as I say, later in the class when we get into simulation methods, we'll look at these MCMC algorithms in much more detail and revisit this concept. But just be aware that it's a kind of simple heuristic you can apply to almost any sort of problem. So, any questions about that? Another example you often see is something called a genetic algorithm. So a genetic algorithm is not something that has anything to do necessarily with problems in genetics. It's something that simulates a process of evolution of solutions. And the way it does that is to create a set of candidate solutions, maybe a set of hypothetical TSP paths. And then it simulates processes of what we call mutation. So basically something like what we did here, where you try tweaking some small thing about your solution to make a similar but slightly different one, and the process of what is called here mating, which basically means take two solutions, try to hybridize them some way, and come up with some solution that's a bit of each. And then in a genetic algorithm, you just run through rounds of optimization where you repeatedly mutate and make your solutions, pick the best solutions that are left after that process, and then those become your new solutions for your next round of mutation and mating. So that's a genetic algorithm. It's another thing that generally doesn't give you any guarantees on how well it will do, but it's usually pretty easy to code up for any kind of problem you have, and so it's something you can try if you don't have other ideas. There's a whole literature and a whole field of study of heuristics. There are all kinds of exotic algorithms you'll sometimes see. There are things called a particle swarm optimization. There's an ant colony optimization. So just uh, lots of ideas like this where people just try to come up with some general strategy that can be easily applied to many different problems. And, uh, this is something that you can spend years studying all the different heuristics out there. I think it's good to know at least a couple of basic techniques. So any questions about that? Okay. So let's say we've run through all of this. We can't come up with a good heuristic or our heuristics don't work well enough. None of our other methods have tried, that, that we've tried have worked well. Often that gets you to what people really do in practice with hard optimization problems. And that is basically to use what I call the kitchen sink approach, which pretty much means just take all these different kinds of techniques and throw at the problem anything that might work. That is really what people do in a lot of these hard situations. So if you're trying to solve, let's say, a very hard vertex cover problem, it might be that first you run an, opti or, or you run an approximation algorithm, you get a good candidate solution, then you plug that in as the starting point for a search with an ILP algorithm, and then maybe you cut off your ILP because it's running too slowly, and then you put the best solution it finds into a heuristic algorithm, like a simulated annealing, and let it kind of clean up the solution. And that's the sort of thing you might do where you really need to get the best solution you can and none of these simple techniques is working. And so I always like to put that there is one more step after this I'll suggest and that is give up. So sometimes you do need to know that your, the model you're working with is just not going to be solvable, and sometimes you do need to kind of go back to the drawing board and try a different model for your problem. So it's always good to keep in mind that that's not necessarily a bad thing to do, and if you really realize nothing else is working out, you can go to that point. Now this isn't an exhaustive list of strategies. There are other things you can try, and there are people who are experts in many of the individual things I've talked about, like how to do ILPs, who might be able to get a solution that works well with an ILP, even if we wouldn't be able to do that. So those are things you can consider, but often you just need to get something working, and then you may need to go and revise your algorithm or your model and come up with one that leads to more tractable algorithms. 
general on tractable and intractable problems? Okay, well the next thing I wanted to talk about then is to move on to the first of what I call the case study lectures in this class. And a case study is basically something that I use to try to illustrate the concepts we're learning in the more uh, topical methods-based lectures by going through some example of a field of biology where people have had to go through the, these issues of modeling and developing algorithms and try to see how that's been done in practice and some of the ways that the principles I'm trying to teach you apply to that field. And I want to do the first of these with a topic I've been using for a number of years now, and that is sequence assembly. Now, I will point out that I've, I've been teaching a lecture on sequence assembly and what this has to do with modeling for about 10 years now, and the field of sequence assembly has changed quite a bit in the last 10 years. So the chapter from the text that's based on this is a little dated in some ways. I'm going to try to update that. In some ways, I think I kind of got lucky with this chapter in that I happened to uh, pick up on some methods I thought were interesting from a modeling perspective that actually turned out to be the methods people are now using for a lot of these things. So I, I think it is still a very good topic to look at, but just be aware that the coverage in that chapter has uh, changed a fair amount, and what I'm going to talk about here in lecture is focusing on some different issues and talking about uh, some newer kinds of issues that have come up since that was written. One of the ways that comes up is I used to spend a good deal of time on the basic methods of sequencing, and I think there's more theory to talk about now, so I'm going to skip over all of that. You can read the chapter, the references in it, if you really want to know how sequencing machines used to work, and there are some papers I can give you. I think I may have already put them on Blackboard if you want to know more about the current state of the art in sequencing. But for the purposes of this lecture, I'm just going to assert to you that we have really good technologies for sequencing DNA strings. So basically, we can take a big piece of DNA, we can break that into lots of little pieces, and we can run these little pieces through a sequencing machine, so a sequencer, and this will tell us for very large numbers of pieces of sequence what the DNA sequence of these is, as long as these aren't too long. So it depends on the exact technology you use, what too long means, but more or less your upper limit is going to be about 500 to 1,000 bases. That, that's starting to change, but basically that's what you can get. So you can take big pieces of DNA and you can get sequences of random little pieces of them. And that more or less is what a sequencing machine does. And most of what this lecture is about is the question of how we take that basic capability and turn the capability to sequence little pieces of DNA into a capability to sequence big pieces. So things like a whole chromosome or a whole genome. All right, so to explain what this has to do with computational modeling, it helps to say a little bit about where the field stood before there were computational algorithms for doing this. So people did try to sequence DNA before there were really computational ways of putting together large DNA sequences. And the general strategy was kind of twofold. So the first piece of it was a, a technique called chromosome walking. And chromosome walking is simply a kind of uh, manual way of taking the capability of sequencing little pieces and turning it into a capability to sequence big pieces. And the way it works is essentially as follows. We take our big piece of DNA, so maybe a chromosome. We just identify some little piece of it whose sequence we already know or can guess or something like that. So we get kind of a little starting point here. And we use that to get a primer to the sequence. And then we can do a PCR reaction that lets us copy out a little more of the sequence. And then we run that through a sequencing machine. So we can get the sequence of, let's say, a thousand bases, so a kilobase of DNA. And once we know that kilobase of DNA, we can then look at the last few bases of that and turn that into a new primer. 
So we get a new primer to our sequence that primes a PCR reaction. We read a little further. We, use it, we get the sequence of this. Use the end of that to get a new primer, sequence a little further, and so forth. So that lets us very slowly walk our way across the chromosome, hence the name, and can give us big pieces of sequence using a machine that's only capable of sequencing small pieces of sequence. This does eventually get stuck, though. Can anyone think of why that might be? Why can't you just get whole chromosomes out this way? Uh, repeating genomic sequences in your organism? Yeah. So very commonly, a genome will have repetitive regions, the same piece of sequence occurring in multiple places. And that's going to be a problem because if we have, let's say, a repetitive piece of DNA here that also occurs here and here, then when we try to create a primer against that repetitive region, it will prime multiple places in the genome and you just get a mess out of your sequencing reaction. So basically you get stuck there. The old strategy for doing this to get to larger pieces used a second step in the, the first really large scale version of this for the human genome, did this by what was called a clone by clone strategy. But basically the key tool is a technique called mapping. And what mapping is, is basically a way of saying that if chromosome walking can get us moderately big pieces, so maybe they can go from a kilobase that our sequencer gives us up to, let's say, 100 kilobase sequences then we can try to find unique pieces of sequence known as markers that occur within these. So maybe this has a marker A, and we find that this also has marker A. And that would tell us that these two pieces overlap. So we can kind of line them up in some way. And maybe this one has a marker B, and this one also has marker B, so we can line those up. And there's other kinds of information we can use to figure out approximate placement of these markers. But basically the strategy was take your big genome, break it up into these 100 kilobase pieces, sequence those by chromosome walking, then use this mapping to put everything together. So that strategy was okay. You could eventually get to something like a human genome working this way, but it was really too slow and too expensive to be practical. Even at the time people were doing this, it was well known that some kind of technological breakthrough was going to be needed or you're never going to finish the human genome, or at least not finish it in any reasonable amount of time. Do you know like approximately what year this happened? What, can you put a year to the events too? Uh, I think, yeah, if I remember, uh, I, I don't remember the exact starting point. All, all of this, so the end of the human genome sequencing was in, uh, so it's either 2001 or 2002. I, I think 2001 was basically when things were, were finished. So basically it's kind of leading up to that for a few years that people were really doing this in a, 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 in a pretty high throughput way. But that, that's more or less what it was, kind of late 90s to early 2000s. So I, I, yeah, I believe I put some references to that in, in the text so you can read about the human genome sequencing project if you really want to know the history of it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, but basically that's where things stood before computer scientists kind of came on the scene. And computer scientists came along, or computational biologists, and basically said that maybe there's a better way to do this. This is a very tedious, very kind of inherently sequential way of going about things. And maybe there are better ways of using our technologies to sequence a genome efficiently. So the original strategy that kind of came out of the computational literature is something I want to talk about now that actually turned out not to be the thing people use. But I think it's very interesting to study from a modeling perspective. And that is a technique called sequencing by hybridization. by hybridization was basically an attempt to say, let's forget about these sequencing machines. That's a dead end. We'll try a completely different uh, biotechnology and turn that into a way of sequencing large strands of DNA. So what was originally proposed for this was a different technology called a microarray. And for anyone not familiar with it, a microarray is basically a, a small plate, like a glass plate with lots of little spots on it. And each of these spots has attached to it 
many copies of a particular strand of DNA. So this one might have the strand AAAAA, maybe this one has the strand ATAT, AT, and so forth, just for all of these spots. And the reason that's useful is that you can take a pool of DNA, let's say one of our genomes, after you break it up into lots of little pieces, wash it over the microarray, and see where strands of DNA stick to spots on the microarray. And in theory, you should get DNA sticking everywhere there's a spot that's complementary to something in the sample you were washing over it. So basically what a microarray tells you then is which strands of DNA are present, which little sequences like this are present in a sample. And what was proposed for sequencing by hybridization is that we could use that by coming up with an array that's completely covered with a set of what are called kamers, where a kamer is just a sequence of k bases. So a threemer would be three bases, a tenmer would be ten bases. And the proposal was that you could construct microarrays that maybe had every possible tenmer. And then what you could do is break up the piece of DNA you're trying to sequence, run it over a microarray, and you find out exactly which tenmers are present in that sequence. So hypothetically, let's say we had the following piece of DNA we were trying to sequence. CT, AAG, CTAC, and let's suppose we had an array with kamers of length four. So what we could do is we could observe that this sequence contains the kamer CCTA, it contains the kamer CTAA, it contains TAAG, AAGC, AGCT, GCTA, and CTAC. And it doesn't contain any other format. So that would be the information we would get if we were using a former array for this. In practice, really, about 10 mer would be the upper limit. You can get about a million spots on an array, so 10 mers would give you a little more than a million spots. And to do this, you need all the spots of a given length. So that kind of imposes an upper limit. But for this example, let's say we have formers. So if we hypothetically propose that this technology works perfectly, and we know that these are exactly the formers in the sequence, then what we want to do is go in the opposite direction. It's easy to look at the sequence and figure out the formers, but what we're trying to do is then look at the formers and figure out the sequence. And so we needed some computational modeling to figure out what would be the sequence that would give rise to that set of formers. Are there any questions about microarrays and what we're trying to do with them here? Okay, well, basically the idea behind how this works is to use a very simple observation here, which is that if two kamers follow each other in the sequence, so one is a prefix and one is a suffix, they have to agree on k minus one basis. So if the kamer CCTA is followed by CTAA, that can't happen unless they agree on the basis CTA, that it's the K minus one suffix of the first and the K minus one prefix of the second. And that allows us to figure out from a set of these kamers which ones might hypothetically be consecutive in the sequence. So if we observe that we had, let's say, a kamer, AAGC, we would know that only certain kamers could potentially follow that in the sequence. It could be followed by AGCA, and we can look and we can observe that in our data set we have, let's say, an AAGC here, but we don't have an AGCA, so that would tell us that this can't be the one that follows this. We could look for other possibilities. It could be followed by AGCC, it could be followed by AGCG, it could be followed by AGCT, and those are the only possibilities. So we would just have to see which of these occur in our sequence or which occur in our set of kamers, and then we would know the possible ones that could follow this one in our sequence. If you're lucky, just one of these would occur, and that would tell you that either there is a definite situation that this follows this, or maybe that this is actually the last one in the sequence and nothing follows it. But more or less, you would be able to figure that out. 
Now, in the general case, you won't necessarily have a single possible one that follows your initial k-mer. It might be that any given k-mer could be followed by a few different possibilities. And so we need to go a bit further to come up with a well-posed computational problem that can tell us what the original sequence could have been. But we can just follow this logic a bit further and see how to do that by putting the entire thing into a graph defined by these particular edge relations. So if we look at, let's say, the set of k-mers we had before, we can observe that we start with a CCTA k-mer, and we can consider what might come after that. So it could be followed by CTAA, and we can look at our sequences and observe that we do, in fact, have a CTAA k-mer, so that's a possibility could be followed by CTAC, and we can again look at our sequence and we can observe there is in fact a CTAC, so that might be the, what happens next. We could consider the others, could be followed by CTAG, but we don't have one of those, so we leave that out, and could be followed by CTAT, but we don't have one of those either, so we leave that out. CTAA could be followed by TAAA, we don't have that, or TAAC, or TAAG, which we do have, or TAAT, which we don't have. But basically, we only have one thing in our Kamer set that could follow this, and so forth. So TAAG can only be followed by AAGC, can only be followed by AGCT, which can only be followed by GCTA, and then this one we actually have a couple of possibilities, GCTA, could be followed by CTAA, or it could be followed by CTAC. And that then would define all of these prefix suffix relationships. For our original set of k-mers, this graph would encode all of the possible uh, k-mers for which we have the suffix of one corresponding to the prefix of another. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so once we've got this model, if we want to sequence our strand of DNA, we want to de uh, determine what the original sequence was, we can pose that as a problem we want to solve with respect to this graph. And in particular, what we're asserting is that each of these nodes in our graph corresponds to something that has to be in our original sequence. And we know that you can only walk through the sequence by taking edges that are in this graph. And so we can turn that into the computational problem of saying that our original sequence should correspond to a walk through this graph where we visit each of the nodes once. So does anyone know what that's called? How many times? Yeah, so in presenting things this way, we've represented this as a Hamiltonian path problem. by representing it as a Hamiltonian path problem, we know what we're trying to solve. We can say, let's solve the Hamiltonian path. That will tell us our original sequence. Each time we walk another step, we're adding one more base to our inference until we get through all of our observed k-mers. So that gives us a model, but that model has some problems to it. So can anyone tell me one problem with representing this as a Hamiltonian path? Well, if you have the same k-mer that's represented multiple times through what you're trying to sequence? Yeah, it's possible that a k-mer will be repeated. That's something that's not captured in our model here, and you might get an incorrect inference. So if you have repeated k-mers, you're going to run into a problem. We could consider generalizing this. In, in principle, a microarray actually gives you some quantitation, so maybe we can figure out or propose that we can figure out how many times we have to pass through each k-mer, but then we'll get a, a, a tougher problem to solve. But that, that's something we could consider. Any other issues with this model? Uh, the binding specificity is imperfect, so you can have some false positives and negatives. Yeah, so microarrays are a noisy technology. And this is a model that's not going to deal well with noise. If you throw in extra things, it could completely mess up your Hamiltonian path. It may make it impossible to find a Hamiltonian path. Or you may find that one that is really dramatically wrong, that's Hamiltonian because of an extra k thrown in or something like that. So it's not a, a very good way of dealing with the complexities of real-world data. 
we might have a pretty large data set here. So if we were trying to run this on an array of 10 MERS instead of 4 MERS, we might have Well, the main thing is that this is an intractable problem. So it's not ideally something we want to deal with. Uh, as we just learned, we have ways of dealing with that. But in general, you'd like to avoid intractable problems. If you can, they're generally not going to scale well, and it's going to get harder and harder to deal with large problem instances. But basically, there are a few things that are wrong with this kind of model that can be a challenge to deal with. One other one that we'll often run into and that becomes important as we keep going is that even if you don't have repeated k MERS, even repeated k minus 1 MERS can create ambiguity in your possible solutions. So even here, we can kind of see that that could come up, that if we allow for the possibility that we may have repeats here, one possible solution would be to take this walk, and you go around here once, and then end up here. But another possibility would be start here, walk around this cycle, then walk around it again, then again, then again, then again, then go here to end. That would also be consistent with the pattern of cameras we see. So in general, cycles are going to lead to ambiguity. We can find, in some cases, a shortest solution, but there may be multiple good solutions. So all of these things really led to a variety of problems with these sequencing by hybridization approaches. But there was an interesting theoretical insight around the time that people were starting to kind of give up on the sequencing by hybridization approach. And that was that uh, you could actually take the same problem, the same data, and represent it in a different way to come up with a different model for the problem. It seems like it, it might not make much of a difference, but it actually turns out to be a quite important difference. And that is to say that instead of representing our KMERS as nodes of a graph, what we'll instead do is represent them as edges of our graph. So in this model, Let's imagine that we've got the following sequence, CCT, AAG, CTTG, and I'll just declare that K equals 3. In this new version of the problem, what we're going to do is look at all the three MERS. So we imagine we have an array that tells us which three MERS are present. And instead of declaring that a CMER like CCT is a node in the graph, we're going to declare that the nodes are K minus 1 MERS like the node CC would be a node and CT would be a node, but then the thing we actually see, CCT, would label the edge between CC and CT. And we could do the same thing with all of the other cameras here. So we've got a CTA, so we can say that that would label an edge from CT to TA, and likewise, TAA would label an edge from TA to AA, and so on. Another graph we can make from our cameras, and we would have a slightly different problem that we need to solve. So for this kind of graph, instead of asking, is there a path that walks through the graph and visits each of the nodes, what we want to ask is, is there a path that walks through the graph and visits each of the edges? Does anyone know what that's called? So that is known as an Eulerian path. And an Eulerian path might sound like it's a pretty similar thing to a Hamiltonian path, but it turns out that computationally they're very different problems. And actually, Eulerian path is a tractable problem. It's actually, there's actually a linear time solution in the size of the graph, so you can very quickly solve Eulerian path problems. And I, I think this is a neat thing for our purposes to observe that because in this case, just representing the problem slightly differently dramatically changes its computational tractability. And I think it's a nice illustration of something I tried to point out in the previous class, and that is 
that just because the problem you are trying to solve can be represented as a hard problem doesn't mean that the problem actually is a hard problem. So a different representation of the problem might be quite a bit more tractable. And so this led to a different way of posing the sequencing by hybridization problem, where instead of having to solve a hard problem that won't scale well, you get an easy problem that will scale to very large data sets. Now, unfortunately, that still didn't solve enough of the problems with sequencing by hybridization, and it still seemed to be basically a dead end research-wise. The other problems, like the noise and the technology, and uh, the problem of repeats, so you can't get past about k equals 10, and even a moderate-sized bacterial genome will have repeats of much more than 10. Those seemingly kind of killed the technology. But as we'll see towards the end of this lecture, the theory actually ended up becoming very important for the field, even though the technology was kind of a dead end. So that I, uh, I illustrate is kind of a long turn of modeling, but remember that for now, because we'll be revisiting this a bit later. But for now, what I want to do is move on to what people actually did for at least the first large eukaryotic genomes, so things like the human genome, and then we'll return to why this was important a bit later. Are there any questions about these Hamiltonian or Eulerian path representations before we get to that? Uh, we'll get to that. So that's part of why I'm saying this is important. The theory behind this is actually very important to how people work with RNA-seq data today. So that's, that, that, that's kind of a preview of why this is eventually becomes relevant. Any other questions? Okay, so what people actually ended up doing, at least for a time, was to use a very different approach where they went back to the sequencing machines. They figured out the arrays were just not going to work as a sequencing technology, but with a different kind of method than the chromosome walking clone by clone strategy called shotgun sequencing. And the idea behind shotgun sequencing is that we would take our big genome, so there may be a chromosome that we're trying to sequence, and we would fragment it, so break it into little pieces, where these little pieces are the things our sequencer can read. And unlike the clone-by-clone clone strategy, we're not going to try to break these into 100 kilobase pieces and sequence those. We're just going to break them down to more or less the size a sequencing machine could work with. So let's say one kilobase fragments. And then directly run these random one kilobase fragments to our sequencing machine. So we get lots of one kilobase sequences. And then we're going to go through a process called assembly. And assembly is the process of taking all these little sequences we get off of our sequencing machine and trying to figure out what big sequence they all came from. So we can represent that as a computational problem. Let's suppose we have our big sequence. We've broken it into lots of little one kilobase sub-pieces. We would have redundancy, so probably we would have many overlapping pieces at different points in the genome. So maybe we've got millions of these one kilobase sequences. We find out what strings encode them, and then we want to ask what was the big sequence that all these little sequences came from. Can anyone suggest a computational problem we could use to model that? The way I've described this, for a relatively simple objective function, this leads to one of the things I refer to as a, a classic optimization problem. In particular, if we use a version of our concept of a parsimony objective, that the simplest solution, in a sense, is the most plausible one, then what we could say is that the most plausible and most parsimonious solution is the shortest sequence that would have given rise to all of the sequences we observe. Or in other words, that our solution is the shortest common super sequence, or excuse me, super string of all of our input sequences. 
So we run our sequencing machine, we get lots of one kilobase strings, and then we ask what is the shortest common superstring of all of those strings. All right, so that gives us a model of what we're trying to do here. So is that a good model for this problem? Yeah. How do we know the sequence of these small fragments? Well, that's something that uh, a sequencing machine would give us. So, so that's part of what I kind of skipped over in this lecture, how you get these, so how a sequencing machine works. But uh, basically, there are a variety of technologies now that can take a short strand of DNA and that can tell us what sequence of bases are in it. So for, for that, I, I'd say uh, check the, the textbook or the references online if you really want to know how, how it works. But, the technologies are changing so rapidly, I don't think there's any point in learning in detail how any particular one works. And any other questions? Okay, well that's a, a model, but in some ways it's not a great model. So first of all, it's an intractable problem, and as I've mentioned before, that's not ideally something you want to have. So. We're typically in a eukaryotic genome. We would need to deal with, at a minimum, a few million of these fragments. And solving an intractable problem on a problem size of millions of strings is probably not going to be something we can do to optimality, maybe not something we can even do close to optimality. But people did more or less try to work with that kind of strategy. And they needed to use a version of one of the techniques that I mentioned previously to solve a hard problem, and that is the transformation technique. They used a transformation I didn't mention, but to a problem we've seen before, and that is they took this shortest common superstring problem and turned this into a version of a traveling salesman problem. It may not be quite obvious what a superstring problem has to do with traveling salesman problems, but to see how this works, I can show a, a simple example where we imagine we have just a few strings. Let's say we had GGA, CCACT, ACG, GG, uh, GA, TPA, CACT, GGCCA, and TTA, CGGA. Let's say those were our fragments, that are sometimes referred to as the reads off of the sequencing machine. What we want to do is come up with a shortest common superstring, and the logic that we would use to do that is very similar to what we saw in constructing the Eulerian path or Hamiltonian uh, path graphs. And that is to basically use the fact that two things can be consecutive in the sequence if a suffix of one is a prefix of another. So, for example, in this case, we could observe that this begins with a GGA and this ends with a GGA. So it could be that this sequence is followed by this one and that the actual sequence contains the substring TTAC, GGA, and CCACT. So that might be an actual piece of our sequence that would be consistent with that observation. We could also observe that a suffix of this is a prefix of this, and then there are a few others of those we can observe. So this prefix is equivalent, uh, is, or this suffix is equal to this prefix. And what we can do is come up with a way of trying to figure out how these go together based on these observations of which suffixes match which, which prefixes. In a sense, every time we take two sequences and line them up by a suffix to a prefix, what we're doing is reducing the length of the concatenated sequence by the length of that overlap. And so we can pose the problem of trying to find the shortest sequence containing all of these as the problem of walking among a graph label by these sequences, where the weight of an edge in the graph is equal to the amount of overlap between the suffix of the start of the edge and the prefix of the end of the edge. So we could say that this gives you an overlap of three, so we'll give that edge a weight of three. This will give us an overlap of three, so that has weight three, and so forth. Now if we pose the problem this way, then what we'd be trying to do is find a path through our graph that maximizes the weight of the edges. And that, that's not quite what we want to do with a traveling salesman reduction. 
the traveling salesman problem, you want to minimize the weight of your edges, but fortunately there's an easy fix to that, just to make them negative, and then you've solved the problem. So once we do that, we can just say any things that don't have any overlap have weight zero edges between them, but basically you get a graph, you get weights on the edges, then the, sh the lowest weight uh, traveling salesman path is going to correspond to the shortest common superstring. So we have a solution for our problem. And that's more or less how the earliest real sequencers worked, or samplers. It seems like there are a lot of um, correct answers um, if you were going the shortest part. So what's the chance that the shortest um, is actually the correct answer? Yeah, so that's a, a complicated question. And really, you would want a relatively large number of fragments that you have appreciable amounts of overlap between consecutive fragments. Because if you try to do this really with overlaps of three or two or one, it's not going to work. You'll just get noise. So one of the complications in actually doing this in practice is that they don't really look for exact matches like this. They actually use something like a blast search to find significant matches, and that also gives you tolerance to errors and things like that. So basically, you're trying to find things that match that, to a degree that would be implausible by chance. And that, that's really how you would figure out the weights of these edges. So that basically does give you a way of solving this. There are other complications. You also have to remember that you're dealing with DNA sequences, so some of these might be reverse complements of others. You have to account for that. But basically, this kind of gives you the heart of something that will be able to solve these problems for reasonably large genomes, so things like a bacterial genome. These assemblers would still run into problems eventually, though. So in particular, this kind of approach wouldn't work for something like our genome. Can anyone think of what might go wrong if you tried to assemble a human genome in this way? Well, one thing is that we actually still need to deal with the repeat problem we dealt with before. Now, in the sequencing by hybridization case, you couldn't have repeats longer than your k-mers, and your k-mer is about 10. So you couldn't deal with a repeat of more than about 10 bases in your sequence, and anything except maybe a small viral sequence will have repeats of length of more than 10, so that was a pretty serious problem. Here we can get away with repeats up to about the length of a read from a sequencer, which as I mentioned is about a kilobase, so somewhere on the order of that for the longer sequencers that were available. So you can pretty much use this strategy, as I've described it, to assemble a bacterial genome. So bacterium probably doesn't have repeats, or at least not many, that are on the order of a kilobase, but a human genome does. So a human genome has lots of repetitive DNA, some of the repetitive regions quite large, and that creates a couple of problems. One of them is that we often have what are called tandem repeat regions, where we'll just have more or less the same sequence repeated over and over. And if this tandem repeat region is longer than our read length, then we can run into a problem where maybe we've got individual reads covering pieces of this. So some of them telling us that we've got a piece of this repeat, some of them telling us that we've got a boundary between two of these repeats, and so forth. And that, that can lead to a problem called collapsing repeats, where maybe we've got a region of these that is 100 of these in a row, but any particular fragment you look at would be consistent with just two of these in a row. So if you've got a fragment entirely within one read, it looks like it could have come from here. If you've got a fragment spanning the border between two of these repeats, it looks like it could have come from here. Basically, you can't tell that you're looking at 100 copies of this instead of two copies. So that's one thing that can go wrong here. We can also run into problems even with distant repeats in the genome, if those repeats are big enough. So if we have repeats that are bigger than our read length, let's say we've got a non-repeated region A, followed by a repeat, followed by a non-repeated region B, followed by a repeat, and then C, then repeat, then D. 
This also leads to an ambiguity, because any particular read we see is going to tell us that maybe we've got an A followed by an R, and an R followed by a B, and B followed by an R, and an R followed by a C, and so forth. But that would also be consistent with the sequence AR, CR, BR, based on these short reads. So the repeat problem, even though this shotgun strategy resolves it for things on the order of bacterial genome, is still going to be a problem for something like a eukaryotic genome, so something like our genome. All right, so does this make sense to everyone? All right, so this was a case where computational methods alone couldn't solve the problem. So there really isn't any way to tell from the data, as I've described it, which of these situations we're working on. So this is kind of an interesting case where we needed an improvement, but it needed to be an improvement that would basically use our biotechnology more effectively, but in a way that was kind of cognizant of the computational problem we were trying to solve. And what ended up coming out of this was a strategy where someone realized that there was kind of a loophole in something I told you about the sequencing technologies that gave a way of solving this problem. In particular, what I told you about the sequencing machines is that they can sequence up to about a thousand bases of a piece of DNA. And the catch in that is, the loophole is, that it's not exactly true that a sequencer can just sequence a thousand base piece of DNA. A sequencer can take a piece of DNA of any length and sequence the first thousand bases. So basically, you can get the first thousand, and then they kind of run together, and you can't figure out what's going on. But that turns out to be a very important, if subtle, distinction, because if you can sequence the first thousand bases of a DNA strand, you can also sequence the first thousand bases of the complementary strand, and that gives you a really crucial piece of information, and that is that you can get two sequences that you both, where you know both of the sequences and you know approximately how much distance is between them. So that was what was known as a mate pair, or a paired end sequence. And essentially, what people realized they could do is they could get these mate paired sequences, they could pretty easily separate out strands of DNA to get libraries of different lengths, so you could get, let's say, a library of sequences separated by 50 kilobases, and then know the first and last thousand of each of those, and a library of them separated by 10 kb, and know the first and last thousand of each of those, and maybe a shorter library of 2 kb, or you know, first and last of each of those. And by putting together these different libraries, we could come up with a way of solving the repeat problem in practice. So in particular, if we had a sequence like this, and we have maybe one of these big tandem repeat regions, then what we could do is come up with, let's say, a mate paired pair of sequences, where we happen to get an, an anchor sequence on each side of our repetitive region, and then, since we know where this sits and here, and we know where this sits and here, and we know the distance between these, we can figure out how many copies or a repeat we have. So it doesn't 100% fix things because there might be subtle differences between the copies, and that's still hard to figure out. But we can more or less figure out uh, that there are a certain number of copies of a certain repeat here. Likewise, if we have this situation where we might misorder things, that's something that we can figure out by these anchor sequences. So we can figure out that if there is a mate pair that sits in the A region, and another one that sits in the B region, we can figure out that A needs to be consecutive to B modulo this repeat, and that maybe C is sitting closer to D, and so forth. So again, we can resolve these distant repeats. So that really is the technology that became the way the human genome was sequenced. There are a lot of details I'm leaving out here, but more or less that's how it was done. To come up with these mate pair libraries and then use those to resolve these repeat problems and put it all together into a big computational optimization where you can get large pieces of sequence. 
it doesn't 100% solve the problems. There are going to be still pieces of missing sequence. There are going to be some mistakes that come out of this that need to be fixed. So it's a fairly long process called finishing that has to be done after this kind of assembly, but more or less that's the technology that was used. Now this make pair process does introduce some pretty serious complications for us. And in particular, introducing these make pairs means that we can no longer exactly represent this as a traveling salesman problem. So knowing that these are a certain distance apart is no obvious way to fit that into a traveling salesman model. And so what people really needed to do to come up with a solution to this is something like what I had referred to as the kitchen sink approach to solving a hard problem. They really needed to throw in a lot of heuristics, throw in lots of other information that kind of gives you hints, solve pieces of it kind of offline, and then use this make pair information to try to throw things together based on solutions to something more like the traveling salesman problem. It gets quite complicated in practice, but basically this shotgun assembly using paired end sequences is the way we created the human genome and the way most eukaryotic genomes or most large genomes are created today. It's still really the dominant technology for that. So any questions about any of this? Okay, so that brings us to more or less where things stood as of a few years ago. And as I say, this is still the main way you would assemble a large genome, but there have been some pretty big changes in sequencing technology. And these changes in sequencing technology have been creating problems for sequence assembly. And one of the big changes has been that sequencing machines now work quite a bit more efficiently than they used to. I mentioned that you would typically need a few million reads of, of these sequencers to do an assembly like this. So the human genome originally had about 10 million reads, I think it was, went into the assembly process. But that is trivial compared to what you can get from a modern sequencer today. So a modern sequencer might give you billions of reads, and you'd like to be able to use those to solve your assembly problem. And that, unfortunately, becomes an issue when you're using something like a traveling salesman uh, transformation or even a more complicated sort of heuristic solution to kind of this messy uh, paired end traveling salesman thing. It's not going to scale to much larger problem sizes. And so there's been a lot of interest in trying to find faster ways of solving this and ways that will be scalable to larger and more complicated data sets. And that's where we kind of come back to some of the methods that I'd said were sort of a, a dead end with the sequencing by hybridization approach. And the first way that was kind of brought back into the field was with a suggestion to do a new kind of way of taking the advantages of both approaches that was originally referred to as shotgun sequencing by hybridization. And the idea with shotgun sequencing by hybridization was to say that the microarrays from sequencing by hybridization just were not going to work out as a sequencing technology. But maybe there's a way to use the sequencing machines, which have gotten really good, but put them into the kind of the model we had been dealing with with sequencing by hybridization. And the way that was originally proposed worked as follows. Let's say we've got our big piece of DNA and we've got our fragments of this. And we're going to assume that our fragments are things our sequencing machine can read. So maybe you know, a thousand bases at a time. What we would like to do is have enough of these so that we are more or less covering our original sequence and covering it with a fairly high amount of redundancy. So we've got lots of fragments sitting over any particular piece of the sequence. And then what was proposed is that maybe we can get around the, the repeat problem on the microarrays if we can use these reads from our sequencing machine to create a kind of virtual microarray that's better than any real microarray we could make. And the suggestion was the following. Let's take each of these thousand base strands and let's artificially fragment it into a smaller number of fragments. So let's say we make 
30 base fragments by just taking whatever the sequence of this is. So this thing, we know a 1,000 bases in a row, read off the first 30, say that we've got that, read off the next 30, read off the next 30, and so forth. And we'll just call these k-mers. So we'll say that we know the first 30 mer in the sequence, we know the next 30 mer, and so forth. So we end up with a big library of 30 mer sequences. And in principle, if we have enough of these big fragments and enough overlap between them, that we always have at least 30 bases of overlap between consecutive fragments, then what we're actually getting out here is the complete set of 30 mers found in our original sequence. So what we're getting is basically the same information we wanted to get from the microarrays, but we're getting much longer sequences than you could get from a microarray. So if you tried to build an array with every 30 mer, that would be, I think, just over 10 to the 12th uh, spots on your array. That's much more than is actually possible. But we can do this, or yeah, okay, maybe that's 10 to the 18th. But anyway, it's a large number of spots. But you can get this by fragmenting your uh, sequences, and then you can just take the algorithms that we used for our sequencing by hybridization approach. We can take each of these artificial 30 mer k-mers, and we can make an Eulerian path graph out of those. So we can take, let's say we've got one of our original sequences, A, C, C, T, A, G, G, and let's say we're making an artificial, I don't know, five mer array, just to illustrate the idea. We could say that we have this piece of sequence, A, C, C, T, A, and we're going to turn that into an edge in our, our earlier impact graph that is running from the node ACCT to the node CCTA. We can say that we've got the fine five mer CTAGG, or excuse me, uh, yeah, CCTAG. And we can say that that runs from CCTA to CC, or excuse me, to CTAG, and it's labeled CCTAG, and so forth. So create the graph just as we did before, and then we get a graph in which finding the Eulerian path in that graph will assemble our original sequence, and in principle will give us an assembly that solves the entire problem of, that we would have solved with the sequencing by hybridization, but using a much better technology and effectively giving us these 30 mercamers that let us deal with uh, repeats effectively up to length 30. So length 30 is going to be enough that we can do a decent job even with something like a bacterium. And so it was proposed that th this didn't quite solve the problem to get to humans or something equivalent, but it gave away of very quickly assembling bacterial genomes or things of that size. So that was the proposal. And so far, people still don't quite use that too much for assembling entire genomes. But that ended up being really the basis for a very widely used approach for assembling smaller pieces of DNA. So if you're assembling, let's say, a transcript, so assembling sequences from RNA sequencing data, this is basically the approach you would use. So for some of the technologies now, we don't even need this fragmentation step. We can get enough coverage that we can just deal with virtual thousand mer arrays or whatever. But basically, if you're trying to do transcript assembly, even up to something like bacterial assembly, this is more or less the approach you would use. So one unfortunate thing in, uh, that comes about in the in the, the text is that, uh, unfortunately, the name of this technique that was used at the time I wrote the text is not the name that people generally refer to today. So I'll just mention that if you actually see people referring to this, you will usually see this referred to as De Bruyne graph assembly. So a De Bruyne graph is another name for this kind of graph we've created. So unfortunately, the, I don't ever, as far as I can recall, use the term de Bruyne graph in the chapter of the textbook, but just be aware if you see that term, that's referring to this particular kind of Eulerian path algorithm. And this ended up being something that is very scalable and deal with very large numbers of reads, so it's very well suited to the state-of-the-art sequencing algorithms that are producing huge numbers of reads. So are there any questions about any of that?
Right, so the technologies are continuing to advance, and I want to mention just briefly in the last few minutes of class some of the directions things are going that are really cutting edge research right now, but I think are likely to be satisfactorily resolved within a few years. So one of these is that there are, is now available basically paired end reads for all of these state-of-the-art sequencing technologies, or not, not all of them, but basically you can get these advanced sequencers that can give you billions of reads and can give you paired end reads. The theory hasn't quite caught up yet, but that's a research problem now, that there are people working on paired end De Bruyne graphs. So there is some stuff in kind of the theoretical computational biology literature for dealing with paired end kinds of sequences and that's starting to make it into assemblers you can download and use on your own paired end sequences. And, and I, I think the details of that will be worked out well enough that eventually we're going to get to the point that these De Bruyne graph assemblers are going to be the dominant technology for assembling large genomes. But so far, that, that's not quite there yet. People still assemble their large genomes with something more like the kind of heuristic traveling salesman things I was telling you about. The technology is continuing to advance. Uh, often the sequencers that we've been using the past few years are referred to as second generation sequencers. And there are now out what people call third generation sequencers, which are basically characterized by much longer reads. So there's a company, uh, Pacific Biosystems, or often you see them referred to as PacBio. They've been kind of the leader in getting through longer reads. And they've got technologies where now they can get read of, I, I think about uh, 10 kilobases is maybe the upper limit. But it has some problems of its own. It tends to have uh, a large frequency of missing or inserted bases, which is a very messy thing to deal with computationally. But that's kind of becoming something practical for solving many of these problems. I mentioned this briefly in the homework, so just be aware that's what I'm referring to when I talk about it. And there's a lot of work on trying to do a variants of what is called single molecule sequencing. And single molecule sequencing is basically the idea of getting away from this entire assembly problem and just sequencing a whole chromosome at once, or sequencing a whole DNA molecule of arbitrary length. There are various technologies that people are working on that may or may not end up solving this problem. So I mentioned in the text something called nanopore sequencing that people were working on 10 years ago when I first started teaching this. They're still working on it, may eventually get there, but that, that's maybe still the most promising way to get to the full uh, prom whole chromosome sequencing. So maybe all this will become obsolete, but for the moment we still need these assembly problems. There are lots of other variants. So there are some people who do what is called metagenomic assembly. That's where you might take a sample, let's say, all the bacteria on your skin, fragment them all together, throw all of that into a sequencing machine, get out all the reads, and try to assemble lots of different organisms in parallel. That, of course, is a much harder computational problem that people are working on that. There's a related thing called quasi-species assembly, so try to isolate something that is very rapidly evolving, like a, let's say, a, a virus isolated from an infected person, where you'll have many different strains of the virus at once, try to sequence that, and even just representing the diversity of species in, in a sample like that is a challenging problem, but trying to assemble it and figure out that diversity is something people are working on. There is diploid assembly, so trying to separately assemble these <coughs> copies of a diploid chromosome from fragments. So lots of variations on this. It's really a, a, an interesting area to work on. If you follow the literature, always new results coming out. All right, so I think I will stop there. Are there any uh, other questions about any of this before we break? Uh, don't leave yet, because I want to hand out your homework assignment. So. Um, yes, yeah, so you can pass these around. Again, uh, this is on Blackboard. You should be able to download it there. And please make sure you refer to the guidelines from the uh, original course information handout for the rules for turning in assignments, especially with regard to programming assignments. Please make sure you're all familiar with uh, all, all of the rules. <laughs>
especially rules for what is allowed as collaboration. So, so any last questions before we break? Okay, I guess I'll see all of you on Tuesday.